You could write a book about the challenges that people have with technology, or two, or three. Uh, and I'm on my third. Um, around two years ago, I found myself consistently on some incredibly difficult projects as a consultant. For the last 10 years, for the most part, I've helped companies implement new technologies. And most of them did a very bad job at it. And the statistics would really bear that out. Something like 60% of all, te all technology projects either missed their budgets, went over their deadlines, didn't give people the desired functionality, or some combination of all three. 60%, right? And that's probably conservative. So I wound up writing this book. And if someone asked me, as people do, what's this book about in a word, I will say people. Okay, the technologies themselves are fairly mature, but they don't implement themselves, right? This isn't the Terminator movies, right? So someone makes the decision to do something or not do something, listen to someone or not listen to someone, and before you know it, poof, okay? So that's basically the first book. And my goal tonight is to talk about um, more of the third book, but I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, if it's just me talking for 60 or 75 minutes, then I don't feel like I've done my job. Um, and feel free just to jump in. We have a small enough crowd. I spoke last Friday at the Chamber of Commerce, and I intentionally spoke for less time than I had to a lot more time for questions. So I just think that it's more important for me to address whatever you want after I talk a little bit about who I am and what I can talk about. There are certain subjects that are just way beyond my scope. Okay? So a little bit about who I am. So why should you listen to me? I'm a consultant, speaker, and writer. And my three books are... The Next Wave of Technologies, which is the second one that came out in, I want to say, March. Why New Systems Fail, this was the second edition that came out in, I want to say, February. And The New Small, which is, I think, my best book, and that'll be out next month. So what do these books have in common? Well, again, people and technology. Are these books totally related? No, nah, there's a lot of overlap, okay? Uh, you won't find any Agatha Christie or, or uh, Daniel Steele in any of them. Although for a technology writer, I've been told I have a lot of panache. Okay. So with the new small, it's about small businesses and emerging technologies. My favorite band is Rush. If you go to my website, you will find more Rush references. In fact, even in my books, I snuck in as many Rush references as my publisher would allow me. And from their last uh, song's release, there's this great quote. In a world where I feel so small, I can't stop thinking big. And it's just this very, very um, deep quote for me. And I started thinking about this in the context of technology. One of the things that's really fascinated me is the evolution of technology. Um, 15 years ago, when I first started using the internet, there was no Facebook, right? Uh, there was no Twitter, right? Uh, search engines, we talked about this at dinner, were terrible, right? Anyone use the web back in 95, 96, show of hands? Okay. It's a pretty different place right now, right? Okay? It can be really overwhelming when you think about it. Yet, the more that I thought about it, when I would go to get, get my tennis racket restrung, I would talk to, in what a racket, right on Bloom, uh, Bloomfield Avenue, I would talk to Linda and Stan and say, what are you guys doing with social media? And they'll say, what? Right? And that's not to pick on them, because most businesses really aren't using, say, social media, right? They might have a Facebook page, but what are they really populated with? Right? What do they really do? And I remember speaking at the Chamber of Commerce about six months ago to a technology committee. And it was like I was speaking Greek. I could not believe the basic questions that I was getting, which led to me to believe that there was this sort of fundamental lack of understanding about all the technologies out there and how small businesses in particular were really at an advantage. Who here has ever worked for a big company? Okay. Usually not the most nimble, right? Anyone ever work in the public sector or healthcare? Okay. They're not exactly beacons of change, right? So the basic premise of the new book, The New Small, is that it's better to be small. And in tonight's talk, I want to cover some of the material that I discuss in the book. But again, we've got plenty of time, and we don't have that many people, but quality trumps quantity. So jump in if you have any questions, OK? So I'll go through my dog and pony show, and then hopefully we can have a little Q&A, OK? Everyone can hear me OK? Okay, traditionally, if you think about it, many small businesses have been really behind when it comes to adopting technologies. There's something called the technology adoption life cycle. Long story short, most organizations are laggards, right? How many people bought an iPad or an iPhone the minute it came out? Anyone? Okay, 
Most people wait. Most organizations wait. And bigger organizations wait for longer periods of time. Why, anyone? Why, why aren't all organizations on the cutting edge? I'm sorry? Wait to get the kinks out. OK. Anything else? Change. I'm sorry? Sometimes the price comes down. Yeah. Budget cycle, OK. So there are a lot of reasons that big companies maybe aren't at the sort of um, lead uh, when it comes to technology adoption. But there are different challenges for small companies because they can typically move a lot faster than their bigger brethren. Okay. One of them, long implementation times. I have worked on projects for a year or more, and I've only been there for part of it. Okay, for a small business, you really can't take a year to do something. Okay, that's a long time, right? IT project failure stories and statistics. Again, all in my first book. The Burt Hand teaches best. There are so many examples publicized about companies involved in lawsuits. Anyone ever heard of the IBM SAP implementation with Hershey's chocolate? Well, I'll put it to you guys. If you run a candy business, what are the two times of the year that you don't want to miss distributing candy? Anyone? Halloween. Halloween. No, no. No. Anything else? <laughs> Christmas. I heard Christmas. OK. Now, I'm sure Easter and, Hall and um, St. Valentine's Day are up there. but. Uh, just uh, this happened seven or eight years ago. It was a multi-million dollar lawsuit. Uh, Hershey's Chocolate could not meet all of its orders because it was in the middle of an SAP, which is a large software vendor uh, implementation. Okay, so their whole supply chain couldn't function. Now, while that may not happen to the same extent that a smaller company, again, these stories are out there in the media. So if you're in a small organization and you don't want to do something, case in point. Resourceability. Again, small companies, anyone ever work for a small company? OK. I'm a small company of one. If I don't do it, it, get, it doesn't get done. OK, now that's an extreme. But if you have 10 people in a company, they're all probably pretty busy. Again, having worked in larger organizations, I think we've all seen people sort of sitting around. Anyone ever see that Seinfeld when George digs the desk, uh, makes a bed underneath his desk? OK. I, I've literally worked with people who have had basically nothing to do. Okay, I have not seen that very much at all in my career working with smaller companies. They just have too much to do. Okay, so even if you can convince a small business that they need to have a, a system, right? And by system, what are we talking about here? Some of the most important systems for organizations are, say, CRM or customer relationship management, right? If you go into many big companies and you say, can you produce a list of your customers? I'm not kidding. Many of them will say no. They don't know how many employees work there, how many customers do business, much less if you want to get into more sophisticated analytics. right? Where are most of our sales coming from? Which products? Okay? Which employees are responsible for the most sales? To me, these are basic questions. And I can tell you from a lot of arguments with people that those are questions not typically easily answered. Okay? Now, it's more prevalent at bigger companies, but it's still an issue sometimes at smaller companies. Perceived need. Sometimes people think, you know what, Microsoft Excel is good enough. And look, I love Excel. Okay? I've read the Excel Bible, I think, in terms of Excel. But it has limitations. Okay? Or maybe you use an Access database, all right? or Microsoft Word, or something like that. Those are fine applications, but they have a certain purpose. Okay? Sometimes people don't want to change. Again, people issues. Priorities. This along, goes along with perceived need. Sometimes people say, you know what, right, we really could use, say, Salesforce.com, which is a CRM system to manage customers. Or we could really use uh, Workday, which is a, um, a particular application for handling HR and payroll. But you know what? We've got 10 other things to do. OK? Bad decisions. Um, as I said before, sometimes the burnt hand teaches best. Many organizations, even smaller ones, have struggled implementing new technologies, and as a result, Right? They've been down that road before, and they're a little timid to do that again. Okay? This is very interesting. Going back to what I was saying before about the explosion of different technologies and content, there are so many different options right now. When you think about it, you say, well, how should I build my platform? Right? For, for blogging, just as an example, my website runs on a platform called WordPress. Has anyone ever heard of that? Okay, something like 20 million blogs, last time I checked, ran WordPress. It's very popular. 
okay? But that's not the only one. You've got ones like uh, Joomla or Squarespace or a myriad other ones, okay? Sometimes, in a way, if you think about it, it's almost like the Cold War, right? The Russians were the bad guys, right? And now when the Soviet Empire fell, I often make this analogy, well, who, who are the bad guys, right? Well, it kind of depends on the day of the week. So it's a much more complicated world. The answer isn't always obvious. In terms of software, go back to the mid-1990s, right? That was sort of the high point of Microsoft's hegemony. Okay, everyone ran Microsoft Office. Everyone used Windows. That's not the case today. Okay, so we have all sorts of different choices. And to some people, that can be overwhelming. Okay, a lot of people, we just came up at dinner. Some people say, I don't know how to get started in, say, social media. Okay, and it can be overwhelming, right? We, we're tweeting and friending on Facebook and LinkedIn and all these different sites. Sometimes people don't know what to choose. Okay, the final thing, and this is very important, is finding the right scale. If you look at the vast majority of what I call enterprise 1.0 applications, and by that I mean in the 1990s, they tended to be what they would call client server applications. In other words, you had to have the physical application installed on typically your desktop or laptop, okay? And that's how you used it. If you didn't have your laptop, you couldn't check your email, okay? Now, if you go into enterprise 2.0, which is really, in a nutshell, the subject of my second book, The Next Wave of Technologies, Organizations are moving beyond that. You don't need to know exactly the right scale. You don't need to have your laptop with you to access your email. Who here doesn't have a cellular phone? Okay, it's a very different world right now. So with regard to scale, there's been really sort of two competing forces here. Uh, software as a service and cloud computing. I'll just define those very quickly because maybe, maybe people don't know what they are. With cloud computing, in a nutshell, I can give you a very technical definition, but cloud computing means that your data and your applications are essentially available anywhere, okay? You don't have to have your laptop or desktop. You can access basic information on your mobile phone. No, you're not gonna write a book on your iPhone, although actually somebody has, but that's sort of exceptional. Software as a service is also very similar. You essentially rent the software, okay? You don't buy it per se. You pay by the license or you pay by the transaction. So at the end of the year, if you had a great year, maybe you paid more, but you don't have to find the right skill. You're not confronted with a $50,000 purchase decision when you don't even know if you're gonna use it, okay? It's a way of sort of um, dating before you get married, if you like, okay? That's no longer a problem now, okay? Now, the technology is one thing, but technology, as I said before, doesn't exist in a vacuum, okay? So what are some of the trends that really have enabled these small companies to do some pretty amazing things. And there are a bunch, there are eight or nine I, I detail in the book. The first is the rise of the freemium model. Has anyone ever heard of freemium before? Okay, Chris Anderson is a smart guy. He wrote The Long Tail. He's the editor in chief of Wired Magazine. All right, is his best selling book, right? The Long Tail, the future of business is selling less of more, right? The whole premise behind that is if you go into Barnes and Noble, well, you're probably not going to find these. Maybe you will, I don't know. But it only has so much physical space, okay? With the long tail, you can go on Amazon and search for as many books as you want because Amazon has warehouses with hundreds of thousands of square feet. So it's the world's largest bookstore, okay? So his second book is called Free, The Future of a Radical Price. And he introduces something called the freemium model, okay? Now, if you haven't heard of it, it's essentially a way of testing software and getting certain features for a limited time, okay? Or maybe you get the whole thing on a trial basis. Has anyone ever downloaded anything from the internet and after 30 days you had to register, you couldn't use it anymore? Okay, that's basically one version of the freemium model. And this is really, and, and Anderson writes about this, and it's, it's a great book, I, I really enjoyed it. Anderson writes about this book, the prevalence of broadband and the increase in the availability of storage and the decrease in price means that companies can give away their software in limited doses for free. Right? Okay? So you no longer have to even have a disc, right? Remember the 1990s, those AOL discs? I'm dating myself here, right? Well, you know what? AOL, I think at its height, had 38 million members, so it could afford to waste money. It could send everyone in this room a CD, but if, if Karen, you signed up, right, then it made it worth it for them. Who, when was the last time anyone saw a software CD in the mail? I've never seen it, okay? Does anyone here still dial up to get to the internet, or do you all have broadband? Okay? So, you can download very large files very quickly and try something out before. Again, going to what I was saying before, you don't need to make some kind of very complicated, expensive decision, and if you're wrong, you're going to be fired. 
these companies try out software first to see if it actually makes sense for their organization before. Okay? So things really can happen in a more organic way. It's not all top down. Okay? So the freemium model has been huge. Okay, improved offshore development. This is essential. Jobs in the United States started going offshore, I want to say high tech jobs around the mid 90s, give or take. And if you read any of the books or talk to any of the people involved with early offshore, there were some real problems, right? Developers say in India or the Philippines, right? Well, the language isn't the same. The time zone difference, okay? Cultural things, right? Having a conversation with someone is not the same as being on a phone call or exchanging emails. There's a great example in my second book by a friend of mine, Jason Horowitz. This book actually has contributions from a number of people other than me. And in India, if you're talking to a developer and that developer says, okay, that doesn't mean I understand. That means I acknowledge, okay, I heard you. And that's a lot different, okay? Now, things have actually progressed a lot with offshore development. You didn't really have video Skype or video conferencing back in the mid 90s. So if you can see someone, right, anyone ever heard the statistic 90% of all communication is nonverbal? Okay, that's true. So one of the companies that I profile in the new small is called Peerport and they have worked extensively with developers over in India and they've actually had a lot of uh, very positive results. Improved outsourcing. Uh, outsourcing again was all the rage in the 90s. The companies would try to outsource everything. Okay, and there still are some things I would argue that are silly to outsource, right? Business strategy, sales. Why would you outsource that, right? That's supposed to be your competitive advantage, right? But why would you do payroll, for example, in-house if you've got 20 people? Anyone ever do payroll before? I spent a lot of time doing payroll. It's horrible. It's not easy. Taxes, it's a lot of complexities. Um, fortunately, I don't have to do it now. I just give my accountant a bunch of financial statements and he tells me how much I owe the government. But there really is no business advantage to doing some of these things in-house. In fact, in the new book, I talk about how some companies will actually even outsource their CFO or chief financial officer function. They don't have the money to pay someone $150,000 to be their head of finance. Okay, so they'll, they'll basically rent one. Okay, these people use resources, not just technology, but people on an as-needed basis. Okay? Next up. As I mentioned before, the explosion of software choice. There are so many options right now, it is unbelievable. If you don't like Windows, okay, I just bought a Mac. There's also, um, anyone ever heard of Linux software? Okay, it's open source software. In fact, a lot of companies will run Linux servers even though they have Microsoft on most people's computers. But if you're a hardcore techie, and I don't put myself quite in this boat, you can actually download something called Ubuntu, which is basically free a free operating system. Google is coming out with a Chrome operating system. Okay? And if you look at most phones, right, does anyone have a Windows OS on their phone? Probably not, right? If you've got an iPhone or you've got a Palm, they really don't run those kinds of apps. Okay? So there's a lot of choice out there. A few more. The rise of the social customer and social technologies. This is absolutely huge. Anyone ever heard the term um, social CRM or social customer relationship management? Okay. Has anyone here ever had a bad experience with customer service? Okay. <laughs> Who hasn't, right? I used to work in customer service for Sony Electronics back when I graduated college in 1994. No one calls Sony or any company and waits on hold for 20 minutes to scream at you because they're happy with their product. Okay. Now, when I worked at Sony, one of the statistics that I remember just like it was yesterday was that the average angry customer told 60 people, okay? Imagine what that is today, right? I assume most people here are on Facebook or Twitter, okay? I'm assuming you each have more than 60 friends, whatever, however you want to call them, right? So it's very easy to express your anger and have other people, right, hear it, okay? And there are sites like ComcastSucks.com, okay? So there is a social customer out there and these smaller companies understand that. I told the story at dinner. This is going to be a repeat story for some of you, but it's a great story. And I told it about myself when someone gave this book a one-star review because it wasn't available on the iPad, as if I had any control over it. Well, rather than tell you that story again, I'll tell you a similar story. One of the companies that I profile in the book is called Chef Tony's, and it's a seafood restaurant down in Maryland. The title of the chapter is just brilliant. It's his job title, so I can't take credit chief seafood officer. How cool is that? This guy is awesome. 
he understands social media like very few people I've ever met. He's constantly putting on, uh, up on YouTube uh, videos of him cooking or cutting fish. He is constantly blogging and sharing recipes. He's engaging customers. He understands that if people aren't happy, right, they're going to say something about it. Okay, so true story. About, I think it was six months ago, he found a blog online. He uses Google Alerts, right? They're free, anyone can set them up, right? Anytime anyone says anything about me, as far as I can tell, Google lets me know, good or bad. So there was a customer who went into his restaurant and had a bad meal, and he blogged about it. He was a food critic, okay? So Tony's um, Google Alert tells him, Tony tracks the guy down online and said, oh, I'm sorry, you had a bad experience. Can I call you to talk about it? And the guy, you know, the guy had a bad meal. He wasn't evil, right? So Tony talks to him and said, oh, you're right, you know, that shouldn't have happened. Come on in, next meal's on me. Well, that guy changes his blog post and is now one of this guy's biggest advocates, okay? So the social customer is really important and only, I think, foolish companies disregard them. Now look, it's a lot easier for a relatively small seafood restaurant to use Google Alerts, okay? If you're Comcast and you've got millions of customers and even 1% of them aren't happy, that's a lot of people, okay? But there are tools for that, right? There's a company called Radian 6 that makes tools specifically so that companies can monitor the sentiment out there. IBM is working now on some very cool technology with sentiment analysis. It's called Snazzy. And they can take the unstructured data that's on the web and turn it into something meaningful. This is just fascinating stuff to me. But again, I'm a big geek. Structured data is really, if you ever worked with Microsoft Excel, right? you've got a table. You've got, say, a list of family members if you're planning a wedding. It, it's structured, okay? It's, it's data that's in a very sort of, um, um, it's in a bunch of uh, columns. Unstructured data is a Facebook update. It's a tweet. It's a blog, okay? So there are tools out there that will let you analyze this and turn it into something that's a little bit more concrete than just, oh, I don't like your company, okay? These, the new small really understands that there is a social customer out there, and if they don't take care of their customers, somebody else will. With the exception of maybe your power company, and I live in townhouse here in Caldwell, I can't get Fios, I can't get, what's the other one, Cablevision? I have to use Comcast, okay? But maybe in two years I won't. Anyone hear what Google's up to recently? Google TV, okay? I mean, if you wanted to use Hulu to watch TV shows, if you wanted to use Netflix, right? Remember what I said, broadband and storage, okay? You don't have to go, Blockbuster just declared bankruptcy. Okay, so there's a lot of change going on. So even Comcast, and again, this came up at dinner, understands that there's a social customer out there. That's why if you go to Comcast Cares on Twitter, that's an actual handle. So if you go, my cable is out at Comcast Cares on Twitter, and you tweet that, you're probably going to get a response, okay? So there's a social customer out there. Next up, and this is something kind of near and dear to my heart because my master's is in labor relations from Cornell University. Um, if you go back 30 years, it wasn't uncommon for people to work at one company for their entire career. My aunt used to work for, I think it was Reader's Digest, for something like 25 years before she got a pension, okay? And I remember it was something like 1995, I was in grad school, the New York Times did this big story about how companies were laying people off at the same time they were announcing record profits. Okay? Now, I don't want to turn this into a whole philosophical debate about what's the obligation of the uh, corporation to society, but long story short, wherever you're working now might be the, rest, uh, the place you're working for the rest of your life. Maybe not. Okay? So I think that particularly if you're in a generation X or generation Y, it's very unlikely that you're only going to be working one place for the rest of your career. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing. The flip side for small companies is that there are these very talented folks becoming available, okay? You're no longer guaranteed to work at a, an IBM or a big company, okay? Next up, and I'm a contractor, so my phone does ring, even in this economy. Uh, companies many times are reluctant to hire a proper employee for a job. Now, who knows what will happen with the healthcare legislation. I think that some small businesses are actually exempted, but this actually may continue. It's a lot less risky from a legal standpoint to hire someone like me. I think I have some rights in the workplace, right? No one can punch me, no one can sexually harass me. But if you look at the labor legislation, particularly in big companies, they are covered by, it's very difficult to fire somebody if that person's in, say, a protected class or is a whistleblower if, if you don't think that person's doing his or her job. That's why you hear at these bigger companies about people who are essentially dead weight and they can't get fired, okay? And it isn't just companies, okay? 
I just heard that on Facebook. This, this blew my mind. Teachers were fired for poking students in inappropriate ways and making all sorts of sexual advances. Now, anyone know what percentage of teachers gets fired every year? Very low. It's something like one in 2,500. Okay, so you really have to screw up to get fired as a teacher. So I don't necessarily think that they're gonna be using contractors to teach because I think a lot of people still wanna be teachers, but the point is you really can't be guaranteed to work at one place for your whole career. And for a company's perspective, if you bring me in and give me an hourly rate, that's more than what I would make on an annual basis. You don't have to pay me benefits. You don't have to worry about lawsuits. So if you have a particular project and you have someone like me who has plug and play skills, you might just want me for two weeks or two months. This assignment I'm on right now, maybe two months max. So if you look at what a lot of people are doing, they're actually really their own bosses when you think about it. They're running small businesses, even if like me, they're just working for themselves. And this really feeds into the new small because there are two types of owners who really started these companies. You have A, sort of the serial entrepreneurs, people who never really wanted to work for the man. And then B, you had people who after maybe 15 or 20 years working said, you know what? I think I could do a better job. I'm gonna give it a shot, okay? So some labor market trends have really enabled the new small. And then finally, there's a war for talent. I actually spoke to a guy named Peter Capelli who wrote a book by the same name for the, uh, researching this book. And he made it to the point, it's actually in the book, that small businesses actually have an advantage. Now I'm speaking here at a college, and even though we don't have a lot of college students in the audience, think about this, right? If you're a college student, where do you think you're gonna get the most valuable experience in your first job? Is it going to be what, what I did 15 years ago, working as customer service rep, doing essentially the same thing every day? Probably not, but what if you work for a small law firm, right? What if you work for a small business and they just threw things at you and say, figure it out, right? We don't have people who can do this. So after two or three years, you might not have the pedigree of someone who worked at Accenture or IBM, but what did you do in that time, okay? So think about it. If you wind up working at a small business as a college student, you're probably going to get a lot more meaningful experience than someone who maybe you know, takes a job at a big company. And I don't know if there was ever a stigma for working for a small company, but if you work at a big company and you know that you can get laid off at any time, you're not really indispensable. Has anyone ever heard of an author named Seth Godin? Okay, yeah, he's very popular, very, very successful speaker. And he wrote a book called Lynchpin and I was reading it and his basic, the basic premise of that book is that you make yourself indispensable at a small company, okay? You really can't do that at a big company, right? There's really no job security on some absolute term. You're really only going to have that job security if you show people that you can get a lot of things done, okay? You, you are invaluable, okay? Now, I don't think there was ever a stigma for working for a small company, but are people really that impressed anymore if they say, oh, wow, you know, you work at XYZ company, okay? I don't know. And if you, when I talked to the owners of the new small, they, they didn't care about things like that. They much wanted, they preferred to enjoy what they did and to have a meaningful job and to actually contribute in some way. And that was much more important than title, okay? Or the name of the company for which they work. Okay, now, people issues really matter, but there's a reason if you go back to the cover of the book, this was actually intentional, okay? I specifically, for the cover of the book, wanted to show the people moving the gears, the gears of the technologies. Now, the people really are the more important of the two, but the gears still matter, okay? I can't will my way to do things. The technology has to enable me to do it, but any company can use any of the technologies that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, okay? Nothing stopping a company from using social media, right? Facebook doesn't say we're not letting you set up a fan page or a company page or a product page, okay? Twitter doesn't, uh, uh, prohibit you from setting up an account, I guess, unless maybe you're doing some objectionable stuff. Okay, so what are these technologies? Well, there are five in the book. First up, cloud computing. And again, without getting all technical with the definition, you can access your data and your apps anywhere. Now, cloud computing is actually not a new concept, okay? In the 1960s, it was called utility computing. And trust me, I know a lot about cloud computing, but I can't hold a candle to a woman named Amy Roll who wrote the chapter in this book on cloud computing. It used to be called utility or grid computing and the basic concept is that you can access the, your information anywhere. Now, this wasn't as important in the 70s and 80s, right? Why is it so important now? Anyone? Mobility, okay? You actually have a need now to get at things now, okay? 
So mobility has really enabled cloud computing. Second, I mentioned before, software as a service. Okay, again, companies want to be able to pay a little at a time as opposed to one big fifty or hundred thousand dollar expenditure that may or may not pay for itself in ten years. Okay? They have more flexibility. And the interesting thing is that with, with software as a service is that it sort of changes the whole equation. If you paid a hundred thousand dollars for uh, very expensive software, okay, yes, you can write that off. That was typically a capital expenditure for those of you who are in accounting. Okay? You don't really write off a hundred thousand dollars anymore. Okay? But it becomes an operating expense, right? Like postage, like electricity. And this is something that the new small does all the time. And I'm going to give you two examples. Yes, you can go with software as a service. And you can take a very big expense and make it a small monthly expense, which is, when you think about it, right, very good when it comes to cash flow. There's another thing, though, that the new small does in terms of converting fixed costs to variable costs. Okay? Anyone ever heard of um, co-locating? Okay? Why should I buy an office or, or rent out a floor if I'm not going to need it? There are companies now that actually will let you rent space by the day and even interact with other professionals. I was speaking with a company uh, based in New Jersey at, at a happy hour and I wound up quoting the guy for the book. Again, you're taking a fixed cost and turning it into a variable cost. That gives you more flexibility. Okay? Business 101, if you can make most of your costs variable, that's typically a good thing. Okay. So the software and the physical world sort of collide. Free and open source software. Um, again, it may not even be software per se, but it could be a service. You're, there is so much open source software out there right now, it is crazy. And I'm not just talking about the stuff that most people use. If you don't want to pay $300 for a Microsoft Office license, you can use Google Docs. right? You can use Open Office. You can use the software that other people have created. Okay? But it gets a lot more esoteric than that. One of the companies that I profile is actually a friend of mine. His wife runs a dental practice in Richmond, Virginia with another dentist. And when they started up the practice, they were looking at major expenditures, right? I mean, you can't convert everything to a variable cost. You needed an office. You needed to buy dental equipment. Insurance is very expensive, okay? And oh, by the way, anyone know how much debt the average dentist graduates with? Take a guess. How much? Uh, no, it's actually about half that, about uh, 121000 But That's still a lot of money. So if you're that much in debt, why not try to minimize your expenses? So yes, they could have purchased proprieta proprietary dental management software, okay? Because you have to run your practice. You have to keep track of your customers. You have to know who does what, okay? But there's open source dental software. You can basically download it for free. Now, this is an important distinction that a woman by the name of Heather Meeker makes in this book. She wrote the chapter in open source software. Think free speech, not free beer. Okay? I can download the software, but I can't force you to maintain it or implement it for free. Okay? So you might pay for the services. This company saved $20,000 by finding an open source alternative. Now, some of you may say, I don't really care about what goes on in the dentist, and that's fine. But the new small these companies will typically say what else is available. Now, sometimes they want to pay for the software, right? Anyone ever, any, does anyone here have a Mac? Okay. Uh, Adobe Creative Suites is probably the standard software if you're a graphic designer. Yes, there are alternatives, but that is the one to have. And it's probably worth, I don't know, $1,000, $1,200. But depending on your business, it may be worth it. The point is that not everything should be free, right? But that you should have a choice, okay? And some companies, specifically went with Microsoft products because their clients just felt more comfortable. And believe it or not, some people don't know this, there are alternatives to Outlook. Okay? Next up, as I mentioned before, mobility, absolutely huge. Uh, again, Chef Tony is a great example of that. If you can communicate with your customers through something like Foursquare or, or what's the other one, Gowalla, I just was reading about that, they have about 400,000 members. right? You have to opt in, and that's key with mobility, right? You don't want to be getting texts from people and you haven't given them permission because that's kind of annoying, right? But what happens if you're in a fairly um, well-populated area and you get a text, hey, we're having a special on martinis, and that's what Tony does. And he picks up customers, again, who have given their permission to be marketed to because they just happen to be in the area, right? And it's just amazing what's going on with the app development with iPads and iPhones. Companies will actually have their own applications now, their own mini apps, right? So the new small is using these as well. And then the last one 
social technology, social media and social networks. I could talk for hours about this kind of stuff because so few companies do this well. It's about more than just having a Facebook page and a Twitter account. It's about more than just uh, advertising, okay? It really is about creating meaningful content. I do some paid writing for a couple of sites. They never ask me to plug their particular products. Okay, one company I blog for is called Dataflux. They make data quality software. Essentially, organizations create all this information and they don't do a very good job of managing it. So the data quality tools can turn that information into something more useful, okay? So when I'm blogging for Dataflux, I'm not telling people to buy Dataflux software. I've never used Dataflux software. I've seen it, okay? I'm blogging about the issues. And the premise of Dataflux in this case, and they're actually a small company as well. I spoke at a conference there a couple of um, weeks ago in Palm Springs, California. Everyone, anyone ever been there? Wow. Very nice, 119 golf courses. Their theory is we want to start a conversation with people. We want them to be aware of the issues. And yes, our software can help them with those issues, but as, and I mentioned this during dinner, the guy who's writing the forward to the new small is named Chris Brogan. And he's written, he's co-written Trust Agents and he wrote a book called Social Media 101. He's a very successful guy. He's done very well for himself. And he was on ABC News about three or four months ago and he makes the point, you don't watch TV for the commercials, you don't buy magazines or newspaper articles for the ads. So why am I going to your blog if you're just trying to convince me to buy your stuff, right? Now, don't get me wrong, there's always a little bit of self-promotion in it, right? If I put on my site that I happen to make this point in my book in a particular post, okay, maybe that's sort of implied that you should buy the book. But I'm not, <laughs> you will never find me blogging, here are the 10 reasons you should hire me. I'd rather write here the 10 ways to use social media. Because again, there's so much content out there on the web, anyone is going to turn away if they feel like you're sort of overtly marketing to them. And unfortunately, companies that even have blogs in many cases just have these sort of thinly veiled marketing attempts, right? They will do webinars only to get you to give them their email address so then they can market to you, okay? And you know what, if you signed up for it and you don't mind it, there's nothing wrong with that. There are people who respond. But if you think about it, social tech, I was just reading this this afternoon, Twitter and Facebook have very high click-through rates. Now when I say very high, I'm talking about 10 to 16 percent, okay? If you've ever been on Twitter, any show of hands, anyone on Twitter? Yes. Okay. You don't click on every link, right? Maybe you've, unless you've got five or six friends, right? I mean, it's very difficult to do that. But again, there's that, going back to the social customer, there's that trust. If I follow uh, LeBron James on Twitter, right, who I think after two days had 900,000 followers, okay, then you can make the argument that maybe people are going to buy his jerseys, his shoes, and that benefits Nike and whoever makes the, the jerseys. So again, social technologies are really important in terms of communicating and reaching people because people are going to trust what their friends say, word of mouth, more than they're going to trust an ad or a commercial. Okay? Now, I'd like to make this more interactive because we've got plenty of time. Uh, we could go in a number of different directions, but questions anybody has? Yes. How do you define a small company? Great question. How do I define a small company? I thought about that very much. And for me, it was sort of arbitrary to say you have X number of employees or X number of dollars in revenue. It was really more of a mentality because I know that there are companies that have 10 people that act like big, stodgy, um, you know, political organizations. And there are also companies that are much bigger that act very nimbly. To me, it was about more than a mentality. I think the biggest company that I, that I profile in the book is called Fuentec, and they have, I think, 40 proper employees, but they also have a number of subcontractors. They also, uh, in some cases, share employees, which I thought was brilliant. There's one company that I profile, Torrance Learning. They make e-learning. And they had a need for an administrative person, but they didn't have a need for a full-time person. Now, if I hire you on a part-time basis and you're looking for a full-time job, you might like me just fine, but you need the 40 hours. Well, she actually works with a woman named Marissa Smith, who's also mentioned in the book from the Whole Brain Group. They do social media stuff as well. And they wind up saying, you know what? I can probably use the assistant for 20 hours. Can you use her for the other 20? And they can. So they creatively came up with an arrangement, and they're also very big on technology, in which they basically have half of that person. And the employee loves it, because some weeks they might say, hey, we need you 30 hours here, 10 hours there. She enjoys the challenge. So I didn't really say if you've got more than a million dollars in revenue, you're not small. Uh, 
Um, it was a very interesting set of discussions with these companies because who am I? I'm just a guy writing a book. And if I didn't have the first two written, I'm fairly certain that they might have just dismissed me as a quack. And, and who knows, maybe they're right. Um, but because I had done this before, they, they knew that I was serious. And I didn't insist that these companies open up their books, right? I mean, these are privately held companies, right? If you want to go and see how much money Google's making, right, I'm sure it's freely available, okay? But I did want these companies to tell me, you know, about how many employees they were using. And I wanted them more than actual numbers to talk about challenges. So look, this first book is all about how companies uh, messed up IT projects and really how they can avoid doing that. But this third book is really a, it's a celebration of their successes, but I didn't want it to be a bunch of marketing literature. I really wanted to go into the depths of a, maybe they made a bad decision. What did they learn from it? These companies are very human. So I would rather have gone with a company that might have been a little bit bigger than one I had intended than one that was small but just wouldn't let me into their world. And I really couldn't have written the book without the co cooperation from these people. They, they were great. Anybody else? Yeah. It's, it's a big commitment. One of the biggest myths that people have, and I, and I talked about this a couple of days ago, is that social media is easy. It's not easy. Uh, it's a huge commitment of time. If you go to my site, there are something like uh, 225 blog posts, and the site's been live for a little under two years. Um, now, not all blog posts took the same amount of time. Some are podcasts, some are cartoons, some are videos. I like to have a lot of fun with it, but it does take a lot of time. Um, I would argue that when people say, hmm, maybe we should hire a social media specialist, I think that that's sort of foolish. It'd be like saying, okay, uh, you're going to be the person who's good at communication, right? Or you're the person who's maybe, de you might be dedicated to sales, but when you think about it in the company, you're at a ball game, if someone's talking about, gosh, I really wish we knew a smart tech guy, right? Okay, well then why not sort of put in a good word? So the time component is absolutely huge, and I will say this, I would, from my perspective, it's better that a company does nothing with social media than does it wrong. Because it isn't like there's one bite at the apple, but if you take a look at um, what a lot of companies do, it's just they get really frustrated with social media because they don't see the impact, right? If you start a blog, right, it's not like the world goes, finally, there's a blog, <laughs> right? There's something like 100 million blogs. Most blog posts don't get read, much less comments, much less retweeted, okay? So it takes time to build this up. And Chris Brogan and Julian Smith and trust agents discuss this. It takes time to build up that trust. The reason, the way I'm funding this book is very different. My publisher and I saw very differently when it came to when this book, The New Small, should come out and how much to charge. I'll just leave it at that here since we're being videotaped. Well, I knew that the last two years that I had spent communicating with people online, retweeting their stuff, reading and commenting on their blogs, and sometimes picking up the phone and saying, I got to talk to this guy, right? I mean, social media is great, but there still is a real benefit to being at a conference, shaking someone's hand, picking up the phone, talking to that person. I knew that I had enough social capital with these people that I could probably raise enough money to publish this book myself. And I've raised on this site, kickstarter.com, something like, uh, last time I checked, $4,800. Now that covers most of my expenses. If these people hadn't heard of me before, I don't think I would have been nearly as successful. True story, on Kickstarter, I wasn't the first author to put a book out there. Okay, I saw that it had been done, but one of the books that I saw was actually very intriguing. On Kickstarter, you set up levels. So if you go to thenewsmall.com, you'll see an icon with my big bald head and a goatee, and you click on that, and it takes you to the site, and it's set up with levels. So for $5, you can get your name in the acknowledgments. For $15, the acknowledgments plus a copy of the book. For $25, that and autograph copy and I'd give a, a discount for 10 copies, and for $200, I'd put it out there. I will dedicate the book to two people. And I said, why not, right? Maybe mom will do it, okay? That was the first thing to go. Two people I never met before, but I had followed on Twitter, uh, Julie Hunt and Robert Levine said, what the hell, right? So the dedication of my book will be to my two favorite tweets, and I'll have their handles. Now, that might just be them being nice people, right? It might be good marketing from their, for their businesses, because they're gonna go, who are these people, right? But regardless, I had the relationship with them, even though it was mostly virtual, and I'll take these guys out to dinner if and when I meet them. So there's this social world. Now, it does take time to put in, and if someone says, look, what's your ROI on social media? I honestly have, have no idea. Um, but 
I would argue that anyone in a company should have good communication skills, right? It shouldn't just be for the HR people, right? Everyone should have basic social media savvy. You don't want to put things out there, and that gets into sort of a gray legal area with, well, what's really me being personal, what's me on company time, and I'm not an attorney. But it takes time, but I think that for the companies that get it, they enjoy it, and that's one of the other parts of this book. Uh, I end the book with, um, anyone play tennis? Okay. Andre Agassi book, open. Anyone read it? Okay. Great book. So I didn't like the way that the chapter, I think it's 21, ends. It was kind of eh, right? And as you can probably tell, I'm really excited about these books because these are really dynamic folks. So I'm reading this book, and in the back of my head, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I just don't love the way it ends. So at the end of Open, it's one of the very last pages. Agassiz is divorced from Brooke Shields, and he's thinking of asking out Steffi Graf, and he's really nervous. And his friend, JP, goes up to him and says, you need a pep talk, right? I guess he goes, yeah. And he goes, okay, here it goes. There are two types of people in this world, thermostats and thermometers, okay? Thermometers register the temperature of the room. You're not one of them. You're a thermostat. You change it. And I stopped what I was reading. I said, that's exactly what these people are like, right? They are so energetic and dynamic. They raise the temperature of the room. So I put that in the book with, with attribution. I Googled it. I, I think it was the guy's own uh, analogy or a metaphor. So it was just, these people really don't think of it as work. When you talk to these people, they started these companies, and even the employees are really excited about working there. Yeah, it's work, and everyone still has a bad day, and sometimes you're mad at your boss, but you know what? These are small companies. You don't go to the HR department or file a complaint. There is no HR department. You go to your boss and go, hey, what the hell, man, right? So it's, it's just, it's a simpler, I mean, in, in one of the last chapters, I detail about 10 different management principles from the new small, and one of them is that keep it as simple as possible. Yeah, as organizations get bigger and bigger, you, you understand the complexity. And if, seriously, you have to read this just for some of the decisions. You might not even be a technologist and just go, well, why would I put my data in seven different places? Right? Does that make any sense at all? And it never made sense to me. So when I was talking to these people, interviewing them, there's this great quote from one of the guys. I forget which company off the top of my head. Uh, yes, it's uh, Voices.com. It's a voiceover company. Okay, and I actually may use one of them to do a, a chapter for an audio book. And it's a five or six person company, uh, Voices.com. So I asked them, how do they handle data management, right? And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, a lot of companies struggle because they've got some data over here, some data over here, right? And it's a mess. So, well, let me put it like this. And they used Salesforce.com for the CRM, Customer Relationship Management. I said, if it's not in Salesforce.com, it doesn't exist. And I just said, that's awesome. Right? You have all your data in one place. You say, how many customers do we have? 19, 20, who knows, right? As opposed to at bigger companies, how many customers do you have? Well, it's gonna take about two weeks to get you this list, right? And so these companies waste all this time on basic administrative nonsense, and these smaller companies just say, you know, we, we just don't deal with that, right? Um, so there's another example of this woman, Laura Fuentech, from a company, uh, Laura Shop from a company called Fuentech. They do sort of intellectual property consulting. They have a lot of government clients. I give her a lot of credit. In my first book, Why New Systems Fail, there are a couple of case studies with companies that would not let go of systems that they built. One of them was for a big pharmaceutical company that built its own systems. Why a pharmaceutical company is building its own technologies is beyond me. That's like IBM going, you know, why are we making our own aspirin, right? That makes absolutely no sense. So this woman, Laura Schopp, said to herself, I built this database in the late 90s, early 2000s, but the technology has changed so much that I can't twist it anymore. It needs to be web-based. It needs to be based on SaaS software as a service. I want people to be accessing it anywhere from just a, a web browser. So she retired her own system. That takes a lot of courage because I built some things I was pretty proud of, right? And so, oh, really, you're going to let that go? But these companies, that's one of the things that they do. They're not afraid to say, you know what, this got us this far, but you know what, we have to use a consultant. We have to buy a better system. They're not afraid of that. And because they're small, they can try something, again, with the freemium model, the technology and the people sort of working in concert, they're able to do these things and achieve some ridiculous results. One company, Dodo Case, uh, you might have heard about them. Anyone have an iPad? Okay. Dodo Case makes iPad cases. Right? And they actually work with, it's called Dodo because of the bird that's extinct. They work with an old book binder in San Francisco. And they want to preserve the integrity of the book and make it feel ta like tactile sensation like a book, right? But it's still an iPad, so best of both worlds. 
They've got four employees and they've got over a million dollars in revenue. Okay? They use technologies in really interesting ways. Right? They don't have to do everything in-house. They actually use a company called Shopify for its e-commerce platform, which anyone can use. Okay? So they'll outsource some of their customer service to a company called Five an Hour, which is exactly what it sounds like, customer service at $5 an hour. Okay? Now, not all of it, right? because if people really need an answer, they can pick up the phone and they can actually talk to one of these owners. You're not going to find 1-800 numbers at the new small. This blows my mind. Another company that I profiled is called Red7. The basic premise of this company is that you don't know how to maintain your car, right? Unless you're an audio, anyone here an autophile, right? Knows how to build an engine, take apart a carburetor. I have no idea, right? My dashboard says go to Acura, I go to Acura. <laughs> Fix it, right? What do I know? Now computers would, would be a different story. So the whole premise of this company, Red7, is that people don't really understand all that's going on in their computer. We do. Let's take that off your hand. They're basically a computer leasing company. So you go into Red7 and you lease a computer and you get service for $35 a month upwards depending on the plan. And at the end of three years, you can keep the computer or you can lease another presumably better one. Well, almost all the customers say, give me a new computer and they re-up, right? Because they take it off their hands. Now, if you talk to the guy, his name is Michael Cady, who runs Red7, he's like me, another sort of high energy technology guy. You would never dream of, of having an 800 number. You, you go into his store and you go, you know, hey, Mike, the computer doesn't work, right? And in fact, he actually employs a lot of college kids who are very good with technology, right? They're looking for jobs, it's good experience, et cetera, et cetera. In some cases, his customers are so loyal to the individual employees. <laughs> they say, Mike, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to George. Well, you know, George works for me. I don't care. <laughs> so they're very loyal to his customers. And if you think about it, the people really enjoy helping their customers, right? They're not looking at the clock, right? There's a sort of personal interaction. So I know that's sort of a long-winded answer to your question, but they're just, the way these companies approach problems, it's just, it's so basic in a way. I, I don't think the book is very basic because sometimes, if you think about it, some of the best books out there are very simple. But I think that some companies just get so complicated and so tied up into certain ways of doing things that I've seen this many times before. You look at each individual step and you go, well, okay, I guess this makes sense for marketing or I guess IT would want it this way and sales probably wants this and HR objects here. But when you look at the totality of it, you go, you don't know how many people work here? <laughs> uh, any other questions? I have a question. He's, he's a really bright guy, this guy, Andrew Gossin. And he was saying that to the um, alumni association and to the board there, let me make the case for social media. Let me engage people. Let me spend the time and the resources on it. And how can we measure it? Maybe in terms of funds raised, maybe in terms of you know, interaction, things like that. Um, in terms of ideas w with regard to uh, scheduling, I mean, there are so many tools out there. I, I use a, a tool called Hootsuite, uh, which basically will take Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn data and break it into columns, right? So you're not just looking at one huge uh, Twitter stream. And Hootsuite does a number of different things. And, and there are other sites out there as well, like ping.fm. You can schedule posts to Facebook, right? In WordPress or most blogging platforms, you can schedule posts, right? I could be away from my computer on vacation, and I could have a blog post go live because that's when I told it to go live. So there are tools out there that will schedule it. I'd say for me, um, if you have multiple people populating it, you may not ever have sort of a consistent message, but I would argue you probably don't want people with an antithetical message, right? I mean, if you're letting people basically be the admins of a Facebook page or responsible for sort of a corporate Twitter account, you know, you wouldn't necessarily give all employees and even a hundred person organization free reign to do that, right? Now, the way that I approach social media may not be the same way that a college does, okay? My general rule on Twitter is sort of 60, 30, 10. 60% 60 of my tweets have nothing to do with me. My friend writes a post. Uh, I heard an interesting story on CNN, right? Bless you. Okay? 30% of my posts are probably something that I did. Hey, my new post is out, or I'll be speaking here tonight, or whatever. And then 10% I'll actually put in a little bit of humanity. Now, I don't measure this, right? I don't keep an Excel spreadsheet or something. But I'll say, hey, going to the Rush concert tonight, or I shot an 85 at Rutgers, which was my best round in golf. Okay, sort of letting people know that. Now, you laugh, but it's funny because one of the guys who contributed the $200 to backing the new small never met me before, but we have identical tastes in music, 
right? When I go to a concert, I'll actually send him a picture going, hey, you know, I, I got backstage and just met the lead singer of this band, and he writes back, you lucky SOB, right? So we have this relationship. Now, there are plenty of technology authors out there and talking heads like me. I mean, I don't, you know, certainly don't think that I'm unique. But here's one that, hey, he liked the kind of music that I do. My first book has so many references to my favorite band, Rush, that the Rush fan site, rushisaband.com, you can go and search. Many times I said, hey, Phil Simon, Rush fan, has a new book out, right? Now, a lot of people who like this band are IT folks, right? So when I go to a concert and I meet some fans, I say, you know, hey, what do you do? Really, you're an IT guy and you're a Rush fan. Up, check out your book, right? So again, you're making yourself more personal to people. Now, in terms of what a college would do, again, I don't know about what, what legal would have to say. And, and it's funny because a lot of organizations, particularly bigger ones, say, oh, sure, we endorse social media. But then when employees want to go on Facebook, right, it's blocked by WebSense. They're not allowed to go there. Okay, so how can you really allow people to use it? And this gets back to what I'm saying before. It's a trust issue, right? Yes, if you open Facebook or Twitter, employees can waste time. Okay, absolutely. Right? I waste time on Facebook. Anyone play Scrabble on Facebook? Find me. I'll play with you. I, I love Scrabble. I waste probably an hour a day on Facebook. Okay? So there is the risk of people doing that. Right? But look, you all have to have your vices. And I don't think that there's, you know, Winston, Chur Winston Churchill once said, never trust a man without a single uh, redeeming vice, which is one of my favorite quotes, right? Someone's too good to be true. So there is, I think, a trust issue with it. But, you know, this woman, Laura Shop, and I mentioned this at dinner, made the point if I don't, she runs a virtual company. She hasn't even met some of her employees, okay? And one of the questions I asked her in this podcast about six, eight months ago was, you know, how do you feel about that? You know, you, you letting people work at home. And she's saying, look, if I don't trust them working at home, I don't trust them working for me, period, right? So in a lot of companies, they might have a policy allowing you to work from home, but it's never really enforced, okay? So to me, again, going back to how we started this conversation tonight, technology and people. One of my favorite is, is actually in the book. I took it out of the presentation because I thought it was maybe a little too preachy, but uh, there's a guy by the name of Melvin Hertzberger who used to teach um, technology in the uh, mid-20th century, and he has six laws of technology, and my favorite one is technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral, okay? In, in the first chapter of this book, there are so many examples. I just name a few. You know, Microsoft for years has, has fought open source software. Kodak, anyone remember Kodak's first in, uh, reaction to digital photos? Right? Not exactly cool, because it completely cannibalized their business. There's a great book by this guy, I think his name is Hayden Christensen, called The Innovator's Dilemma. Okay? And the fundamental challenge for all businesses, and this absolutely relates to the new small, is how do I embrace the future while at the same time I'm sort of cannibalizing the present? And it's a really tricky situation, right? I mean, think about it. If you think that Google is resting right now, thinking, wow, we've got 70% you know, of the search market, right? Google makes, what, $30 billion a year? Something like 97% is based on AdWords, right? Those little text ads you see in the right-hand corner. If you don't think right now that Google has hundreds of projects going on to see how they can make additional money, you're wrong. Because they realize that in two or three years, there was a great interview with Google CEO Eric Schmidt on Charlie Rose the other night. And he was talking about social search, which is going to be huge. Think about it. I can search Google and say, OK, what are the best movies to see, right? But what if I search Facebook, right, and throw it out to my friends? I actually did this. Before I bought a Mac, I said, hey, thinking of buying a Mac. Could I have Googled benefits, pros and cons, how to switch? Absolutely. But I wanted to know what my friends thought. And within probably two hours, I had 12 responses. And I think I have 500 friends on Facebook whatever that means. And every one of them was, get a Mac. That you will never go back. And, and I really enjoy it. So that's just an example of how social search is really changing that. And that's why Google is afraid of Facebook. If you look at the statistics of how much people, times people spend online, people spend a lot of time on Facebook. It's something like 45 minutes per session, which is huge. When you think about how most people go to a site, they click, they read an article, they click away. OK? So, it's, social isn't going anywhere. And I think that you can, you know, it's like the Marines, right? Follow a leader, get out of the way. And there are definitely some do's and don'ts, and there are books written on it. You know, Chris Brogan's Trust Agents is a very good book. Uh, Mitch Joel wrote a book called Six Pixels of Separation that's also very good. So there are tons of books on a smaller company. There's a great book. One of the guys who's probably going to endorse the book is a man by the name of Bo Burlingham. And he wrote a book called Small Giants and the subtitle you're going to love, Companies That Would Rather Be Great Than Big. And 
There are examples in his book. It has a lot of case studies. I actually was, believe it or not, it, it's not, uh, my book has much more of an emphasis on technology as his book. His book doesn't avoid technology, but it's not really a focus. But they actually are fairly similar books. And this woman, Marissa Smith from the Whole Brain Group, told me about Small Giants. It isn't just a book, it's actually a community. And I'm doing a podcast with them or a webinar, I want to say late November to promote the book. Um, but these companies know that once you get to a certain size, you can't do what the new small can do. And I think it's a challenge. So if you're already big, um, look, I don't delude myself into thinking that every CIO or CEO is going to buy the new small and go, gosh, we got to do exactly what this guy says. Because look, there's a difference between being able to do something, right, and wanting to do something, right? Uh, I think a lot of these companies would like to be simple. I think if you ask any CIO, are you happy with the fact that your systems are sort of an eye chart? Very few would say absolutely, right? But what happened? It kind of evolved. And I think that you know, many of the companies that are trying to use these emerging technologies are almost trying to get a little bit pregnant. So perfect example, and I was reading this a couple of um, weeks ago online. Companies actually, uh, big companies actually are dipping into the cloud or they're using software as a service, but they're doing it in addition to their old stuff, right? Their legacy systems, right? They're still paying hundreds of thousands of dollars on maintenance, right? They haven't turned everything over, okay? So they're testing this. So they're spending more money on clouds while they have all this other stuff. And at the end of the year, they say, well, our IT budget hasn't done anything, right? It's actually gone up. So where are the benefits? And because big companies have, as you know, a lot of politics, a lot of internal players, one of the chief lessons in talking to the new small about why they're so successful is something called, I don't know if you know this, the principal agent problem, agency theory, okay? For those of you who don't know, the basic premise is this. The more parties you have, uh, the more complex it gets, the more difficult it is to sort of achieve success. Think about a large publicly traded company. Think about the, n the number of groups. You've got stockholders, you've got boards of directors, you've got senior management, you perhaps have union employees, right? You have middle management, you have different departments, all these different factions, and oh, by the way, you've got the government, right? And everyone's pulling in a different direction, okay? So it's no wonder that new technology projects fail, or if you want to read another great book, there's a book called Billion Dollar Lessons, uh, by, um, I forget the names of the authors, but it's not just about technology, it's all about M&A, merger and acquisition activity, and bad corporate decisions, right? Or another book, uh, Jim Collins, How the Mighty Fail, uh, Mighty Fall, excuse me. But the bottom line is this, one of the reasons that the new small is successful is that interests are aligned. You don't have all these disparate factions sort of pulling at each other, right? The owners are the management. Okay, and yes, there are employees, and look, this isn't utopia. Sometimes people get into arguments, but you don't have all these uh, parties pulling away. So I don't know if there's a simple answer to your question. I can't say three parts cloud computing plus one part social networking. I will say this, though. Aim to be as simple as possible. One of my favorite acronyms is KISS, keep it simple, stupid. And as a general rule, and I've, the case studies in this book are all based on my personal experiences. Um, I did not profile Hershey's because that's been done many times before. Um, I literally walked into companies and some of the biggest failures in this book, there's a $3.5 million project in this book that could have been averted if someone had just said, look, why don't we all play in the same sandbox instead? Oh, no, no, we're different, right? Well, what makes you different, right? Do different laws apply to you, right? It's just silly. But again, people who have worked for these companies for 15 or 20 years haven't seen anything else. So they think they're different. They think they're special. The new small doesn't. The number of times that these companies have said, you know what, we implemented one system, it didn't work, so we're going with another one. Now look, they're able to do that. They haven't signed 10-year agreements with vendors. One of the things that I discovered researching the technology options out there is that there are companies now that will have one-month contracts. If you ever work in the software world, you realize that is unprecedented, right? So these companies, by virtue of being small, have more options. So I'd say that they should try to act more small, but look, it's easier said than done. Companies, I don't have a secret sauce. There's no silver bullet. I can't say follow these eight instructions. It takes time. But I think that for small companies, there's a lot they can do because they're not really constricted by their own sort of internal politics. And they can use these technologies quicker. But rest assured, there are plenty of small companies that are still very stubborn and stuck in their ways. And they'll say flat out, I don't do social media because it doesn't make any sense. Now it's like religion, right? I can't argue with that, right? But if you think that the world is going to be less social in 10 years, I'll take that bet. Anything else? Okay, well, I'll stick around and sign copies of both books, but hopefully you found it enjoyable. I appreciate your time.